the research process. No matter how long it took you to do research in the past, and no matter how negative your sentiments are about research, the process actually has just three steps. 1. Ask a question. 2. Collect data related to the question. 3. Analyze the data to come up with an answer to the question. Okay, high five, submit, get a grade, something, something, publish. It's that simple. See you next time. Goodbye. Actually, no. Psychological research takes a lot of time because it's not only about answering the question, like some essay exam or an inquiry that someone makes with you. We try to make our investigations rigorous and ethical, and we adhere to standards of researcher competence, all of which are necessary to make sure that we achieve high-quality studies with practically useful solutions. In psychology, we study complex realities and messy human behaviors, and we have a general research process to make sense of them. Research has a lot of benefits, but we shoulder a lot of costs as well. So far, we've been talking about research as if it's a magical elixir that solves everything without much effort. But you've seen how scientific endeavors are actually limited by what information is available. There are also many costs that make research impossible to do in the first place. Alan Bernardo evaluated the state of psychological research in the Philippines by noting that we have few studies coming out relative to scientific communities in other countries because we lack financial resources, educational opportunities, access to research material and tools, sustained research programs, training and mentorship, and institutional support for researchers, whether in the academe or government, all of which are necessary for an active research culture in the first place. But even if you have these things, research is also costly even for the participants in our studies. As the National Ethical Guidelines for Health and Health-Related Research argues, every time participants sit down to answer our questions or do a task we give them, we take their time and energy. Especially for research about sensitive topics, we can pose serious risks to their reputations, social relationships, subjective well-being, legal status, and economic security. So, one reason why research takes a long time is because we want to minimize any negative effects that our study may have on our participants. Also, we slow down when we plan our studies because we make sure not to waste resources that we have. Robert Rosenthal writes that bad science makes for bad ethics. If because of the poor quality of the science, no good can come of a research study, how are we to justify the use of participants' time, attention, and effort, and the money, space, supplies, and other resources that have been expended on the research project? Bad studies take up resources, and they deny well-designed studies from giving psychology and society more useful findings. That's too much to think of, you may say, so let's just not do research. There's a problem too. When you fail to do research on a particularly important topic, we end up having no insights into something that could have been beneficial. Worse, a less competent researcher can do a bad science and bad ethics study that leaves us in the worst position. Research isn't something that is nice to do, it's something that we have to do. Research is a long and cyclical process. Okay, research is important. We have to do it. Now what? Vicky Plano Clark and John Cresswell gives us a good way of looking at the research process and how it is linked to journal articles, the main means through which psychologists and researchers across disciplines report the findings of their studies. To help us understand how these eight steps work in real studies, we're going to look at Justin Kruger and David Dunning's well-cited classic 1999 article, Unskilled and Unaware of It, How Difficulties in Recognizing One's Own Incompetence Lead to Inflated Self-Assessments. Tano Clark and Cresswell's first step in the research process is to identify a research problem. Good point, because you can't do research if you have no problem to work with. In this step, you specify a general issue you want to address, you explain why it's important to do that study and to whom the study would have any benefit. Dunning and Kruger do this creatively by opening with an anecdote, how a misunderstanding of invisible ink led to the capture of a burglar. They then argue that their study is important 
Because being competent in knowing when particular strategies would work lead to greater success and satisfaction, while incompetence leads to a dual burden. Not only do people reach erroneous conclusions and make unfortunate choices, but their incompetence robs them of the ability to realize it. Step 2. Review the Literature Dunning and Kruger showed how their study relates to earlier work in the field by selecting sources which give starting points on how to study the problem they propose, then summarizing and evaluating what these sources say. For this, they reviewed work related to phenomena like metacognition, self-monitoring, and self-assessment. They agree with these sources because they believe that to be successful in any domain, people need to be competent not only in doing a particular task, but also in understanding why their efforts are failing or insufficient. But what they find lacking in the literature is their own prediction that with great incompetence comes great overconfidence. People who are unskilled are unaware that they are unskilled, yet remain confident in their insufficient skills nonetheless. Specify a purpose, step 3. At this stage, you have a clear problem to work with and a good understanding of what previous studies say. It's time to narrow down your research to as few specific objectives, questions, or hypotheses. Otherwise, you'd have a vague problem and no idea how to wrestle with it. Dunning and Kruger synthesized the review and came up with four predictions or hypotheses they wanted to test, which concern how much incompetent individuals overestimate their abilities, are unable to recognize what is competent performance, are less effective in using feedback to improve performance, and are able to overcome these problems by being more competent in that domain. The next step, choose a research design. As we will see in a future lesson, the research design generally dictates what types of methods a researcher would use, what type of data is viewed as sufficient in answering the question, and how data should be analyzed and interpreted. Dunning and Kruger chose the experiment, a type of quantitative method which allows researchers to identify causal relationships and eliminate alternative explanations. Next, select participants and collect data. There are many types of sampling or methods of selecting participants from a larger group of people, and this depends largely on whether you're working within a quantitative or qualitative perspective. In Dunning and Kruger's case, they opted for university students who signed up for their study. We'll discuss the issue of college samples and psychological research in another time. After they collected data through four studies intended to test each of their predictions, Kruger and Dunning moved to the next step. They analyzed the data using statistical tests and reported what these mean in terms of their predictions. Your statistics in psychology class would tell you more about how these tests work. But for our purposes, Kruger and Dunning's hypotheses were supported by the data. After the data has been collected and analyzed, Dunning and Kruger then tell us, what now? In drawing conclusions from the data, they revisit how their findings relate to earlier discoveries in the field, identify where they think their study is lacking, and make suggestions on what future researchers can do to improve or build on their study. So they revisited how important feedback, expertise, and aspects of their analysis are in understanding the relationship between undercompetence and overconfidence. The last stage, sharing and evaluating the research, is what we're reading right now, a journal article. After all these questions, data, analyses, and discussing, we end up with a scientific output that aims to be a clear and comprehensive report of what the research is all about. Then, these studies inspire new questions and the cycle repeats again. Research can be published and shared in a lot of ways, but they differ in quality and trustworthiness. Plano Clark and Cresswell also point out that the research process is reflected in how journal articles are structured. We identify our research problems, review the literature, and specify the goals of our study in the introduction section. Sometimes, there are additional sections to clearly indicate the research framework, predictions, or questions. Next, the research design we chose. How we sample participants, then collected and analyzed data, are reported in the method section. This section is important in helping other researchers replicate the study to see if the findings hold up with repeated testing or to simply understand how rigorously and ethically the original researchers conducted their study. Finally, 
The researchers answer their questions by interpreting the data, collecting their findings to earlier work, and making summaries in the discussion and conclusion sections of the paper. Of course, the article is bookended by the front matter at the beginning of the paper, which contains information about the journal where the study was published, what the research is called, and who did the study. Most important is the abstract, a concise yet detailed summary of the main objectives, background, methods, results, and implications of the study, which is then followed by keywords or the main ideas or domains tackled in the research. On the other end, we have the back matter, which includes the reference list of studies cited, and optional additions such as appendices for additional information, footnotes or endos for clarifications, or secondary diagrams and other assortments. Other than journal articles, we actually have a lot of places where we can report research findings. Dunning and Kruger first shared their findings at a research conference, an event where psychologists come together to discuss new findings and ideas before they become published. We also have newsletters by psychological organizations, theses and dissertations written by higher-level psychology students, technical reports or policy papers for professionals and government workers, or preprints and other unpublished papers by researchers. These studies differ from journal articles because they have not undergone peer review, a process where researchers evaluate the theoretical, methodological, and practical merits of a paper. When a research is of good quality on these aspects, it gets published. Peer review is actually a complex process with issues of its own, discussed in greater detail by other researchers in their own references. Typically, journal articles are intended for psychologists who have a good background in the field, so they're written in the complex format of academic and scientific writing. But scientific communicators, psychologists, and journalists can translate these findings into outputs intended for general audiences. That's why we have paid books, wikis, blogs, vlogs, magazine and newspaper columns, and even Facebook and Twitter friends, which simplify these findings and relate them to what people would find important in their everyday lives. But we should be critical about how we use these, because these popular format outputs can be oversimplified and denied of nuance at best, and exaggerated and clickbaity at worst. That's why the highest standards of research reporting, the meta-analysis, and the meta-synthesis take the longest. Both of them involve taking previous studies answering the same research question and integrating their findings into one report to evaluate how well the cumulative evidence supports a particular explanation or perspective. The meta-analysis uses statistical methods to quantify the strength of the effects of a particular intervention, while the meta-synthesis uses a systematic process of extracting thematic and qualitative information to create a narrative description of text-based findings from previous studies. There are many ways to meta-analyze and meta-synthesize, but these are beyond the scope of this lesson. Essentially, remember that reports are never alike in quality. Pop psych references can be informative if they're written by knowledgeable experts citing a good body of evidence, while journal articles can still be problematic when peer review standards are weak. So, the lessons in this series will help you hone your scientific literacy skills by taking your knowledge of the research process and its issues and considerations when judging the quality of any study. In this lesson, we tempered our expectations of research by looking at the benefits and costs of scientific investigations. With our morale and motivations high, we learned about Planock, Clark, and Cresswell's eight-step research process and how this can be applied to reading journal articles. We also considered the different types of research outputs with the warning to be critical of which sources we should trust. Next time, we're zooming into what research design and scientific explanations mean by discussing the fabric of research approaches, our theoretical and philosophical assumptions. See you then!